everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I am here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Oh, hi, Nikki. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Pete? <laughs> you, see, you say that loaded. You're outing me as being under the weather. That's what is happening right now. You're, oh, you're telling sorry. the world that I'm a little bit sick and, uh, and that I already wrote begging you to be loud and in front on the show today. <laughs> I have to lean on you. Oh, I we got are, you back. Uh, you know, we are, we've got this, uh, we've got a great conversation lined up, but I didn't want to miss it. I didn't want to miss mm -hmm. it, especially after our conversation last week on uh, gaslighting, which was, uh, I think, a really useful conversation. Uh, so today we're talking about empathy and ADHD, and uh, we have a fantastic guest to help us. And uh, so we're going to talk about that guest and to that guest momentarily. But before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com to get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list right there on the homepage, and you'll get an email with the latest episode each week. You can connect with us on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest at Take Control ADHD. But to really connect with us, jump into the ADHD Discord community. It's super easy to jump into the general chat channels. Just visit TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord and you will be whisked over to the general invitation and login. But seriously, if you're looking for a little bit more, particularly if this show has ever touched you or helped you understand your relationship with ADHD in a new way, check out the Patreon. Patreon is listener-supported podcasting. The, our Patreon supports the team that puts on this show. That's uh, me and Melissa and Nikki and Marion, the people who are behind the scenes making this show work. And so if you like the show and you like the guests and you like the kinds of stuff that we're doing over here, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. That's the place to go to jump in. What do you get? You get a lot of great things. Like, for example, you get to watch the live streams as we record. You get early access to the podcast as they are released uh, a week early. You get uh, access to all the super secret Discord channels you could possibly want. That's where all the really, really good stuff is uh, going on. So uh, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. We deeply, deeply appreciate your support. This show doesn't happen without you. Thanks, everybody. Dr. Tamara Rosier has been a college administrator, a professor, a leadership consultant, a high school teacher, a business owner, and an ADHD coach. She's the founder of the ADHD Center of West Michigan and author of Your Brain's Not Broken. Last week, we explored the concept of gaslighting and how it can have an effect on those of us with ADHD. This week, Tamara's going to help us understand ADHD and empathy and how it might actually make us an e easier target for gaslighting by others. Tamara, welcome to the ADHD podcast. Hey, thanks for having me back. I love talking with you guys. Oh, thank you. Well, welcome. And Pete, I'm joining you. I'm not yeah. fully admitting that I'm sick, even though I just had an on-camera sneezing attack. <laughs> and so I'm just going to be fast with that mute button if I need to today. That's, that's right. right. So, that yeah. is going to, that's going to be our, that's going to be our model today. I, um, yes. You, so as I understand it, and I sadly was not able to attend the conference this year. But the, as I understand it, you were uh, uh, gave a, a presentation at the conference uh, that our folks really, really liked, The Unexpected Downside of Empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Where did that come from for you? Uh, actually, my next book. Uh, I turned in the manuscript. Uh, and so it everything we're going to be talking about today is in my next book, oh. uh, You, Me, and Our ADHD Family. Outstanding. Oh, great. So, oh, so we get a, like a little sneak preview. Yeah, I, I'm just going to tell you guys a secret. Uh, I use the International Conference on ADHD to kind of go, how will people respond to this? Mm -hmm. And so I workshop. Yeah. I use it as a workshop yeah. um, in front of people. So that's great. I get well, very you, useful feedback. I, well, you did get some great feedback uh, from our team because Melissa, it was her favorite session. So oh, wow, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> she really enjoyed it. Yeah. So let's talk about it. I, what is empathy? Let's just define yeah. what this is. I so I think part of our problem is as a society, we don't understand empathy. Uh a few weeks, not a few weeks ago, month ago or so, um, I did a retreat with a really forward thinking church, and they asked me to talk about ADHD and neurodiversity, and I'm like, hey, great. But when I got to the part about empathy, 
um, they were kind of questioning um, <clears throat> themselves because they thought there was one kind of empathy. And I thought I was going to lose the entire room when I said, no, guys, there's more kinds of empathy. Mm-hmm. And again, this okay. is a forward thinking church. They're very thoughtful. Um, and so it, it's very interesting that this group of people who really focuses on serving others did it. Yeah, that's that like their whole high. mission is empathy. exactly you, right. Yeah, like that's well, it's on I the have tip. To- I have to admit, I mean, that's sort of where I go is that, okay, you have that, you have empathy. There's, this is the, this is the definition, not really right. thinking that there's different types of empathy. Yes. So um, I want to share a metaphor with you. Um, and the metaphor is let's imagine our emotions are a big swimming pool. Okay. I'm talking for those of us with ADHD. And so what happens is, when we have ADHD, we think if someone's in that in their big pool of emotions, we need to go diving in after them. And that's right. what empathy is. That's what we think empathy is. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, here's the problem. What's the one thing we always learn when someone is in danger in the water? You don't jump in after them unless you're a trained, highly trained lifeguard. Even highly trained lifeguards can die in that moment. Mm-hmm because the per- person's panicking and they can drown you, right? So unless you're a mental health provider, you don't jump in the pool with them. And, and this made the group I was speaking to very uneasy. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We jump in the pool and if they're sinking to the bottom, we sink with them. Yeah. And I'm saying, nope, there's other ways to do this. Wow. Those of us with ADHD, um, so there's three kinds of, there's three kinds of empathy. And I didn't make these empathies up. This is from research. Okay. Okay. So what are they? The model I follow is the simplest model because it's just three. Um, You can find models with five, six, seven. I'm like, let's keep it simple. Let's go with three. So the three types are emotional, cognitive, and compassionate. So I hear compassionate. I think, oh, that's the pool one. (laughs) Uh, Actually, Yes. Um, but the thing is, we have to keep managing how our um, empathy is working. So let's start with emotional empathy. If okay. you have ADHD, odds are you have extremely high and low emotional empathy within the same person. That kind of makes sense. I can see that. But yeah, yeah. But please yeah, explain further. Yeah. Oh, um, how does that make sense? Why does that make sense to you? Well, because I'm just thinking of my daughter and I'm thinking that like there are moments where she is really like caring and like, oh, I'm going to help this person and I'm going to get through this. And then there's other moments where she's like, I hate people and I'm going up to my room and I'm not talking to anyone. (laughs) That's exactly what I'm talking about. And so in the emotional empathy it's driven by our, our emotions. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a, I'm a huge dog person <laughs> to the point where I can't watch dog movies without getting upset. Right. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. But I can watch true uh, crime with no problem. Yeah. I, that is an odd and thing. how? Right? <laughs> so strange. <laughs> no, it's true. If I'm watching, watching a murder mystery right. and, you know, obviously someone dies in every murder mystery. Yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. What are, what's the facts? Yeah. But if if the murderer goes after a dog, I'm like, oh, I, I don't know. If finish watching this, right? Right. We're talking like a BBC, not a true crime thing, even, right? Right. Yes. Do you hear how my emotional empathy is driving mm-hmm. how I feel with and about others? We we just watched the episode of the Daily Show that went live this week, and it was John Stewart, and he did a uh, like forty minutes talking about the situation in the Middle East uh, and, uh, you know, all the the tragedy going on there and close the show uh, talking about the death of his dog and could not, st- like, contain the tears. Yes. Do you see, like, and, and here's the thing. I'm not trashing emotional empathy. No. Mm-hmm. It is a human gift we have mm-hmm. that allows us to feel with someone. And to feel viscerally with someone. It's a gift. 
But if we only use this one kind of empathy, guess what? We're going to get sucked in and we're going to get sucked in by narcissists. Many of my clients have been in relationships with narcissists. Um, If we only use emotional empathy, narcissists know how to work that. They're like, oh, cool. I can see the strings. I can pull all so these strings all day. Unlocks the door to gaslighting right, here within yeah. a nar- narcissistic relationship. And um, those of us with ADHD are like, well, I know he's tugging on my emotions, but but gosh, I see, I see that he's so wounded. Mm-hmm. And I just feel with him on that. Do you see that part that makes us a beautiful human is actually if we don't temper it, it's dangerous. Yeah. Right? Sure. Right. So Let's get to the two others and then we'll. Yeah. What I'm curious about is do the two others help like balance one another out uh, or are they all just recipes for different ways to manipulate us? And and that's why I make an argument of let's try to use just like we use all of our senses. Let's try to use all three of the empathy so that we understand um, what's happening. Right. Right. So Mm -hmm. cognitive empathy. So. First of all, when I'm teaching this to people, I say, put your hand over your heart to remember this. This is emotional empathy. Um, and then for cognitive, um, it's your head. Mm-hmm. Cognitive em- empathy. And I know this sounds basic, but those of us with ADHD will go, ah, oh, frickle, frackle, what is the, the third one? And, and sometimes it just gives us a little bit of a, a boost if we can do that. Mm-hmm. Right. So cognitive empathy is what John Stewart was showing with the Middle East. Right. Okay. Okay. And that's why, Pete, that was a brilliant example. Um, so it it goes beyond feeling with. You're able to kind of take perspective and go, what's happening here can't be right. People's lives are getting wounded and ruined. Families are getting destroyed. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I have a friend who has family there, and she's lost 50 family members. Yeah. And, you know, she has large extended family all around, but that family unit, like, that's huge. That's going to leave marks on generations and generations to come. And this Mm -hmm. kind of pain that's being seen, right? Cognitive empathy is, I haven't been there. I don't really understand what's happening, but man, this sucks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your John Stewart example. Now, yeah, where we can have both of those examples in the same, you know, exactly. broadcast, right? Exactly. Where he can make that swing from, I know how to rationally approach tragedy and talk That's, about it yeah. uh, on a journey toward hopefully some sort of resolution. And I don't know how to talk about the loss of my beloved dog. Oh, and that's exactly it. So it, it's interesting because um, if he would have presented the Middle East with only emotional empathy, it would be limiting what he could talk about. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Yeah, because he'd be just spitting tears and snot. Right, right, right. Right. Instead, cognitive empathy allowed him to take some distance and go, this this offends my sense of justice. Yeah. This this is not right. And I know it because I'm human. And this yeah. is, right? Right. right. And, and he's very passionate when he's speaking. So I want to be clear that cognitive empathy isn't cold, right? but it's perspective taking. Mm-hmm. It's the mm-hmm. ability to kind of put it into perspective. So everything you've uh-huh. described about emotional and cognitive seems to encompass, in my mind, the third empathy, compassionate. I don't under, tell me why that one is, is different substantively than what we've already talked yeah, about. Yeah, compassionate empathy is where you put action to what you're doing. You know, um, after there's a school shooting or something, you know, people go, our th- thoughts and prayers are with. Yeah. Right. And a lot of people who are angry in that moment will go, we've had enough of your thoughts. Do something. Yeah. Right. right. Compassionate and ca- compassionate is putting your hands out. Um, that's the representation. So we have your heart mm-hmm. and compassion is where you put action to it. So you take this deep concern you have, and you're like, I'm going to do something about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and you volunteer, you, you, do, you do different things. 
because of this compassionate drive. Now, when I work with clients, I see my clients leaning on one or the other and not combining it. So I just met with a um, client yesterday, compulsive helper. She's just a beautiful human. Impulsive as the day is long about helping people. So she's really using her compassionate energy. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, I think she needs to pull back and start to think about some cognitive empathy to get perspective. And because she's not really using that one, it's like a stool that's not going to stand up on its own. Well, it, it's a recipe for burnout too, because you're completely, you have no boundaries at that moment. So time is limited, but you're bringing on all of this stuff, whatever it is that she's doing to help. It, it, it takes time. It takes her away from something else. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, let me use another example. I have another client who has cognitive empathy all, all day long. Not really a lot of emotional empathy is there. Not really a lot of compassionate, meaning action. So, okay. Yeah, this is really interesting, right? So what you're describing to me, and I, you know, I mean, I worked a long time. I know, I know you'll relate to this because this suddenly hits home. Uh, working in higher education for a long time, it feels to me like cognitive empathy is everywhere. This is the academic mindset. Yes. These are people who, who feel a sort of empathy toward a situation and then research the hell out of it, right? And write papers on it. And, uh, but that might be the limit to where they they go. I mean, going back to our John Stewart example, you could you might make the case that compassionate empathy was his editorial choice to host a show with a, a Muslim and a Jew journalist on the same show at the same time yes. to actually teach that process. Like that was a choice they had to make. They could talk about all kinds of dumpster fires going on in the world right now, and they chose that. Yes. To to host. so so here we have an example of kind of all three. That's um, exactly it. Where at the academic example, how many academics do I have I worked with who uh, ha are out of balance in those three? Yes. So, Pete, what, what you just did, and I, I love I love when I talk with you guys and you're putting things together. Um, it's just it, you guys are magical. And I love this. <laughs> oh, um, so, sweet. so, yes, it happens to all humans. And that's what you, you kind of just illustrated. The problem is for those of us with ADHD, we have emotional dysregulation. Right. Yeah. Right. So now this is actually dangerous. Yes. Um, instead of just kind of not feeling, we have the tendency to overfeel, underfeel. We're Take not... on other people's pain. Yes. That's yeah. exactly it. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. How many times have you guys took on someone else's pain when it wasn't yours to take on. Oh, yes. All the time. All the time. I wish I had a bell to ring. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, and we call that, I mean, we call that people pleasing, right? Like, we're just trying to help people. Go. We're just trying to make them happy. That's exactly it. Um. So, am I allowed to swear on here? I'm sorry. I can't, I have to ask before. It's a nice, um, it's not, okay. I, I will, I will You'll uh, diligently that. beep you. Okay. The live streamers right. will get full um, unfiltered I'm not gonna, I'm camera. I'm going to pull out any like $20. Um, <laughs> in, when I work my, with my clients, I have the grown ass rule. And if you are living with someone who is a grown person, there, you only mm -hmm. have to beat me once. Um, ass isn't one of the seven words. Oh, Amber. it's not. You're okay. You can say fine. that ass, ass, ass all the live long day. <laughs> all right. So if you're living with someone who is a grown ass person, we have the obligation to trust them on their developmental journey. That helps us with a boundary. Nikki? Well, I was just going to say, I think as a parent, that's where I, that's, that is so hard because <laughs> we both have adult uh, children or young adult children. And I, when I connected the dots with taking on to other people's pain, that's where I went was, you know, I take on the pain that my kids are feeling when they're hurting and what you just said really 
it's so true because it's me having to let go so that they are grown ass adults and they do need to figure out how to deal with their pain. Okay. So you brought up a special case and I, I do a lot of parent coaching. Yes. We are biologically engineered to focus on our progeny. Makes sense. Yes. Ugh. Which means. What a burden. It is now. <laughs> because we would walk through fire for these people. We absolutely. Yeah. Which yeah. means we're not rational. True. True. And if yeah. one of my babies, and they're all grown kids, okay, mm-hmm. and they're doing great. Mm-hmm. But if one of my babies isn't okay, all of a sudden I'm on high alert. Yes. Yeah. It is different. Yeah. Because you're right. Because if I had like a, um, I don't know, some, like, let's just say I had a foreign exchange student or uh, a a distant cousin that was living with us for some reason, uh, it probably would feel different. I would probably be able to do more of the cognitive empathy and be able to step back and say, okay, I can be there for them and work through it with them, but I don't have to take it on myself. Well, both of you guys, that's coaching in, uh, that's what coaching is, right? It's just an exercise of cognitive empathy. Right. Yeah. Well, actually I practice emotional empathy. I practice all three Mm -hmm. when I coach Um, because my ADHD clients need to know that I'm with them on an emotional level. Now I don't take on their problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll get to like healthy displays in a second. I want to go back to Nikki's special case. So there comes a time when you can have empathy for your child, but you have to dial back your response, your compassionate empathy. And you have to dial back how much you're willing to take on the emotional empathy. And even you have to dial back your cognitive empathy. And so Nikki's in the process of watching her children grow up and go, oh, I have to dial this back now. And this is not easy and it's not fun. And if I were working with her as a client, I would help her to see the times when she's too emotionally empathetic. Uh, By the way, uh, my oldest child is 31 next week. And my youngest is 22. And when they call, and it's such an honor when they call to work through issues, Mm -hmm. it's an honor, right? I put myself on mute because I can't contain my empathy sometimes. Oh, so smart. (laughs) (laughs) I put myself on mute. And then I take myself off mute and I step into motivational interviewing. Well, tell me about that. Well, how, how have you seen that before? And I ask questions. Meanwhile, on mute, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I'm ready. (laughs) Right? Right, right. Because my bond with my kids is a biological bond. Mm -hmm. Um, And for those of you who are adoptive parents, you still have that bond. In other words, there's, you love those humans so much Mm -hmm. in Mm an irrational way. So working with that motivation, um, it's really hard. And I, so that's a special mm-hmm. case. Right, right. But going back to if you're around grown ass people, fully grown ass people, mm-hmm. <laughs> this, especially people you work with, it is okay to feel with, to show emotional empathy. It's okay to have cognitive empathy. And it's okay to have compassionate. But we also have to do the extra step of trusting them with their journey. And we have to go, well, you're in a really sad place. And I'm, I'm really sorry that happened. And we can fully show empathy without taking on their burdens. I, that, that, that feels like a thing to dive a little bit deeper on, empathetic trust. Like, how do you, how do you quantify, qualify empathetic trust? Is it just approaching a, a, like an internal trust relationship aware of the three types of empathy? Is there something else to it? How do I turn that on? Yeah. uh, The only way. (laughs) Okay. I was early on in my life. I watched Terminator movies. And as you do. Yes. (laughs) As one would. Um, And the Terminator always had a screen that he he had in front of him. Yeah. So I imagine a Terminator screen. Yeah. Like you're in your behind your eyes. Behind my eyes. Your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I imagine 
and I have to use my imagination, right? I don't have a reliable prefrontal cortex. So I use other parts of my brain to right. do this. Um, I imagine the scales going up like, good, you're showing good emotional energy or emotional empathy. Okay, how about we show some cognitive? Okay, why don't we raise that? Ask how how you can support. And, and that way I, I'm, I'm managing myself. Mm -hmm. You hear all of this? Um, I'm just going to be really honest. When ADHD people try to show emotional empathy, it can look very self-centered. Yes. Yes. Did That's why I've asked the question. Me? Yeah. Right. That's of course why we asked the question. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, as I'm doing this, <laughs> here's what happens. You tell me your dog died. And immediately I'm, I think back to last March when my dog died. And I'm like, listen, Pete, I am so sad with you. This hurts. Yeah. And yeah. I start crying with you because I was in such pain when that happened. Oh, oh I stopped showing. I'm showing. Yeah, now it's about me. Suddenly it's me time. Yep. Yeah. And then I start uh -huh. telling you all about my dog. Oh, she was right. a great dog. She was the elf of the house. And here's some things she did. Meanwhile, because you've had now six months or a year to process that, and you have all those facts on, like right on the dome. And meanwhile, I just lost my dog. I'm a mess of emotions. I can't talk about it. It just makes it look like you only want to talk about you. Oh, and then, then I skip the co cognitive. I'm like, you know what, Pete, you should do? Here's what I did. Here's yeah. what you should do to yep. get over Oof. this. Ugh, yes. No, last thing somebody wants to hear. Yep. Yep. So this is why balancing the three, um, ADHD people are wonderful people who want to help people. We, we see others, but we can come off as very self-centered um, if we're not really managing, if we have too much emotional empathy. Mm -hmm. um, it's too hard. And, yeah. and because our emotions are right on the surface. So when a client tells me about dog diet, I'm like, Whew, yeah, that's hard to hear because I can feel yeah. with you there. And, and I because have to kind of release is... it and remember my cognitive and compassionate. Because what is the like, what is the muscle we're trying to build here? Like what I'm what I'm imagining in that situation is when I am tempted I mean, I got a story for everything. Like when I'm tempted to, and triggered to tell a story and know that it's me time, like what is the what is the rewiring I need to do? I my sense is I need to stop, reflect and say, what do you need? Right. Right. I mean, isn't that part of it? Well, so what I do is I acknowledge that I'm having an emotional response because I have a face where I can't hide a thing. And by the right. way, those of you who are listening or watching, if you have ADHD, you can't either. So yeah. don't play poker and don't try to yeah. lie. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I acknowledge like, oh, I'm sorry. That sucks. So going back to that mo uh, metaphor that I opened with, imagine I'm going to stay with Pete and his dog for a second. His imaginary Also, dog. my dog is fine, everybody. Like <laughs> yeah. My dog really is. This is all hypothetical. It's I all, love my dog. Yeah, don't say, yeah. yeah. Don't send them condolences. Right. It's all imaginary. And by the way, imaginary will keep me focused, right? Because if it really yeah. did, I'd be like, oh, I got to deal with my emotional. Mm, uh, sure. But when I see someone, let's say Pete is in his pool of deep emotions and he's flailing around because this dog was such a companion. I come by, I sit on the edge of the pool. I don't jump in with him. And this is the restructuring uh, question that you asked about, Pete. I don't jump in and go, oh, my gosh, let me tell you about my dog. Yeah. Let me just flail around with you. Because it's not going to really help the other person in their pool. So instead, I'm going to sit on the edge and go, I've been in this pool before. And I, I'm sorry that you're there. This sucks. I'm showing emotional empathy because I can feel with you. Mm -hmm. But the second I jump in the pool, I also make it about me. Yeah. Right? That's so, that's so, okay, so a developmental question. Can I ask a developmental question? What do you, how do you deal with, with kids like teens? Because it feels very much like teens with ADHD. This is one of those things that they really struggle with. And either they figure it out in their late teen, early 20s, 
or they don't, and it becomes a thing that they struggle with all their lives. Do you have any guidance? Well, um, I didn't have this tool when I was parenting. Yeah. But now I would actually talk about the three kinds of empathy. Okay. Um, I think it would help them understand like what's happening with their emotions. Uh, well, especially that it is a sign of empathy because I know that whoops, people without whoops. ADHD hear a kid with ADHD, make it about them. Like it's me time stealing the spotlight and just see it as they're just being a jerk, but it's really an empathetic experience. And right. that's mm-hmm. really powerful. Oh, I love that. Yes. So Tamara, I have a question. How does empathy play into grief? So not if you're grieving, but if you're with someone who's in the pool of grief, what is your thoughts on how to be there for that person? Yeah, I have a lot of them. So thanks for asking that. Because and it has to do with the three empathies. And do you see how like if we can manage our empathy, we're going to be better for people around mm-hmm. us. We're mm-hmm. going to be better parents, spouses, friends. Uh, we're just going to be better. Because we're not going to make it about us. We're not going to have too little empathy or the wrong kind. Um, so let's say uh, someone um, is in the big pool of grief, right? The big emotion is grief. And a lot of times people with grief, they'll be angry. They'll be splashing you like, I'm mad that this happened to me, mm-hmm. right? Or they'll just like take a deep breath and sink to the bottom and go, I'm just going to stay here. So I work on showing all three kinds of empathy. First, (coughs) I always try to express emotional empathy because that's that's our innate primal one, Mm -hmm. right? That's why we cry when we see others experiencing it. It touches our primal empathy, okay? So I express, this is heartbreaking. And I am so sorry. This is... This is so difficult to walk through. That's like me metaphorically sitting on the side of the pool going, I'm sorry, I can't swim for you right now, but I'm going to sit here and wait with you. I'm not, I'm not going to. um, You're not alone. Yeah. You're not alone. That's emotional empathy. And then I do cognitive empathy. Like, is there a perspective that I need to take here that will help give me greater understanding of the situation? And so one of the cognitive empathy could be, well, I work with this person and you know what I can do? I, and so I'm doing the cognitive perspective. I know that there's a huge project due. And I know that she's carrying a big part of this project. And then my compassionate empathy goes, offer that to her. Now, compassionate empathy, I say, offer it. Don't do it for them because that's breaking the grown ass rule, right? So I'm going to, back to my metaphor, I'm sitting on the side of the pool and I looked around and thought, what can I throw her if she wants to hold on to something? And so I looked around and I see a pool noodle and I go, I have this, do you want this? And I throw it. It's still her choice whether or not to grab it. Because we really have to give dignity to the person suffering. Um, We can't do things for them. Compassionate empathy alone actually can hurt people. And so we want to kind of think, take perspective to go, is this useful for them? And please, if if you see someone in their pool, don't assume you know what's useful for them. Oh, right? wow. Okay. That's huge. Right. Because I think there's a lot of assumptions sometimes what that we make thinking that, oh, we, we know how to help this person because this is what helped us. Well, we can't make that assumption. This, this goes into, I mean, I know you, we've, we've sort of been dancing around the specificity of the, the downsides to empathy that you talk about, but this one gets to, um, you know, under functioning and over functioning to me, right. It, it seems like, and I, we haven't talked much about under functioning empathetic uh, vein. Yeah. Talk about that. Okay. So, uh, under functioning is when I pull back my empathy and ADHD people do this all the time. And I'm sorry to call out us out, 
but here's what it looks like. Listen, guys, I know you're having a rough time, but if you just knew my life right now, I'm surprised I have pants on. So I can't quite care <laughs> what's happening in your life right now. Love you, but if you just knew how much yeah. I'm struggling. Oh my gosh, all the time. Yeah. Tell me, get, tell me more about that. Well, it's it's a I, what I notice it about myself, right? And I, and I notice it when, uh, well, let, let's just take this morning. I'm feeling under the weather. I've taken all my drugs, but I'm feeling under the weather, and I've been traveling. And how easy would it be to say, "Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm totally overwhelmed." If only you knew the kind of travel and the kind of crowds and the kind of anxiety and the kind of everything, uh, you would understand why I have to say I can't do the podcast today. Right. Right which mm -hmm. is not the right choice, right? That's a choice coming from a different, from a, a place of, of yeah, under-functioning empathy, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it's because at that point, you're not thinking of the burden it, it would place on Nikki. Exactly. And mm -hmm. on you and on Melissa to, to be rescheduling and to right. doing all these things, right? Yeah. But I think it's, it's only, you know, here I am, 51, I kind of get my hands around when I'm doing that. I start to see a pattern. But this gets back to what we were talking about earlier. <laughs> it's it's the muscle that we're developing yes. to understand and be able to recognize the patterns because when we are compromised, we are deficient in pattern recognition. That's my Absolutely. thinking. Absolutely. So here, I want to be clear what underfunctioning is, though. Sure. Because... A lot of people would be like, well, Pete, if you're sick, this is called self-care. Are you taking self-care? And, right. and I, I, I want to be clear. Yes. I, I, guys, I get it. I'm a Gen Xer. Um, but there's a difference between self-care and under-functioning, meaning how you're screwing others over yes. in your self-care. Um, right. and there, there's a difference. And so, um, I, and I don't want that self-loathing listener to go, oh my gosh, I underfunction all the time. We're talking about empathy and I'm talking, asking you to be aware of the three kinds of empathy all the time. Now, remember the people pleasers, their empathy is too high and they're over-functioning. Okay. Right. By the way, people pleasers, I wasn't talking about you under-functioning because you're always worried that you are. You're not. You're not. The fact that you're worried that you are is a sign that you're is not. That you're maybe not, you're going right. the other direction. <laughs> yeah. So where is the making excuses for others' behavior? Because that, ah. that I think is an interesting point. Where does that fall in the empathy trio? Great That's over-functioning. Over-functioning. Okay. That means I am married to someone with an addiction issue, but my emotional empathy is like, hey, listen. She had such a hard life. If you knew her hard life, you'd just understand why she's this way. And I am going to do more of the work so this person can feel okay. Now we go back to the grown ass rule. Okay, addiction is a horrible place to be, but we're not helping a person by overfunctioning for them. The big picture of overfunctioning um, is outside of empathy. Um, that means we do too much for others. We're not following the grown ass rule. We're thinking for others, behaving for others, right? Compensating. Um, but when it goes under empathy, that means I am going to give this person all kinds of leeway. They don't have to take responsibility. And I'm just going to keep pouring that compassion, um, that help kind of empathy and that emotional empathy their way. And guess what? When I overfunction, what's missing? The cognitive empathy. Yeah. Right. To frame it and go, hold up, folks. This person needs to take responsibility for their addiction. It's harming the environment. It's harming me. It's harming, you know. So mm -hmm. you see, like, it's so important that we have all three. Yeah. Right. Yes. Where, uh, how does, how does empathy and an um, imbalance in the in your relationship with the three types of empathy relate to rejection and RSD. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think that's too personal. Like, can we just skip that one? <laughs> 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 that's, 
Uh, no. Uh, so because some of us don't have well-regulated emotion at all, and I, I'll be really honest, I'm new to this rodeo. I spent the first 40 years of my life too much empathy in narcissistic family members. Um, I got in relationships with narcissists. It, it was bad. Mm-hmm. And so I got in trouble. I got in hot water this way. And unfortunately, I had to learn things the hard way. I was over functioning in empathy, constantly giving them the break. Well, you know, they had a really tough childhood. And finally, a friend came alongside of me and said this metaphor, which has always stuck with me. I love that you see that this person's on crutches and you want to hold the door open for them. That's fantastic. But are you realizing that every time he walks through the door, he's hitting you with his crutches? Metaphorically, again, people. Yeah. Right? So yeah. my, my over-functioning was the empathy of, wow, I feel for this person. I see how wounded he is. Let me let me just do this. Allowing, uh, thereby allowing them to underfunction. Oh, yes. Every right, time she was overfunctioning. Of this whole thing. Oh, yeah. You have an underfunction. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what are some things that you could do like or practice now that we know this, right? Now that we have this knowledge and we're aware of it, how do we work more towards a balance of all three types of empathy? Yeah. So look for the pitfalls. And the pitfalls are, or the first one is misplacing your empathy. Okay. And usually the misplaced empathy is the emotional empathy. Um, You're just like, oh, I just feel so sorry for every, everything and everyone. Um, I have a client who will see like a dead deer on the side of the road and go, oh my gosh, that just wrecked my day. Right. Right. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't feel sorry for deer, just to be clear. Right. But it's misplacing the energy of empathy where she feels that overwhelmed. I mean, I see a deer on the side of the road. I'm like, gosh, I wish that didn't happen. Right. Mm -hmm. I have I have emotional empathy for that. But when we misplace too much energy there. It's draining to us and a lot of ADHD people suffer physically because of because of this there's the there's a great seinfeld episode where jerry's dating a woman who do you know what i'm talking about the hot dog woman right she she like she cries over everything hot dog falls out of the bun on the floor she's crying 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 and the very the the punchline to that joke is at the very last scene she gets a call that her grandmother died and she's like oh well (laughs) i guess grandma's gone no tears at all like and and jerry doesn't understand that i feel like jerry is my emotional support animal in that episode right like not understanding how um how that's actually an expression again of empathy being uh out those three types of empathy being out of balance. Yes. Yes. And okay, back to Nikki's question. Um, I had a client say to me, uh, she's a veterinarian, very smart woman. She's like, I don't know how intensely to feel about things. And so something we worked on together was concentric circles. And so hmm. her first action would be put it in a circle. Um, and so, you know, she's like, there's just tragedy everywhere in the world. People die. Um, she was a vet. So, and she lost a cat on the table through, uh, by cleaning, um, its teeth. So she was feeling horrible. And she's like, I don't know how to feel. I don't know the intensity. Right. And so we worked on (laughs) defining concentric circles for her to understand where it goes. And that helped her modulate her empathy. Yeah. Do you see, we're talking about modulation and making sure we have all three in there. Yeah. Right. We've, we've got it. And as ADHD folks, this is where I see most of my clients really struggling. Um, it gets us into trouble in a lot of ways. So uh, the n- next one is know when you're in empathetic distress. So this, what is that? What are what is the symptoms of empathetic distress? Yeah. Well, it, we're going back to Pete telling me his dog died. Okay. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so horrible. And I'm I'm carrying on. And 
what's sad is I'm going to start to make it about me. Right. Or I find out something that is so sad for me that I can't eat for two days. Right. And it's not even about me. It's, it's about my neighbor's daughter who's not doing well. And she ran away. You know what I mean? It's yeah. I'm feeling so much about that situation. That's empathetic distress. That's not, if it's outside of your sphere of influence, you really have to question how much empathy you should be showing. Well, well no, this is really interesting because yeah. all of a sudden you bring up like the, the, when you start talking about, again, the circle or sphere of influence, like the, there is either intentional or unintentional sort of manipulation, self-manipulation as we drag ourselves inward toward the gravitational pull yes. of distress and make ourselves a part of the sphere of influence. And that can't be healthy either. No. Well, and, you know, one of the ways that I manage my anxiety is I will purposely, if I see like, well, this just happened last week, there was a a, a news thing that happened. It was so close to home. I could not watch it. I fast forwarded it because we record the news. Anyway, but uh, we, we I fast forwarded it because I just did not want to go there. I didn't want to put myself in that situation because I knew it would like make my anxiety up to 10. Is that just like, I mean, that's just, I think that's kind of similar to what you're saying. It's like, you that's don't have happy. to put yourself into yeah. it if it's not in your sphere. Like that had nothing to do with me. Okay, so you just modeled what you did. You you modulated and you're like, this is too much for me. Mm -hmm. I will go in empathetic distress. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. one of my personal, now I still, I have cognitive empathy for, for what's happening around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and I actually have a lot of emotional empathy for it too. But to help me balance, I look and go, all right, what are my compassion empathy options? Oh, I don't have any because it already happened. It's a new story. Then I have to modulate differently. And this is where my clients start to get uncomfortable, just like that group I was speaking with. Because mm -hmm. they're like, wow, Tamara, you're, you're cold. You might as well be the tin man from the Wizard of Oz, right? You don't have a heart. Oh, dare to dream. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if only. If um, only. But the, the truth is, um, those of us with ADHD, we feel so much. Yes. And I'm learning that that's a waste of energy to feel this un, unguarded empathy. And I need my energy to show empathy to people in my sphere of influence. I need to do that. That's what makes me, um, you know, in my circle effective. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I can't be so squandering. Yeah. <laughs> so I know we need to, to wrap it up. And I have uh, the last question I want to ask you is I'm really curious how you got into this. Like, how how did this interest you? Why did you decide to to write a book about it? Like, just, yeah, yeah. Where where did it come from? So <laughs> I I wrote um, you, me and our ADHD family. Because I saw families doing ADHD common trip, trip ups just all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I started to see this pattern of, wow, family members don't regulate their empathy. And when they don't regulate their empathy to each other, we get in major trouble. We get a 17-year-old who really can't use the restroom by himself because his mom's standing at the door saying, honey, do you have enough toilet paper? Like that's, so we really need to regulate empathy in order to love better. And I, I think this next book is all about, the first part is just get yourself to be a good human in your own family first and then figure out this relationship piece. And the the emotion the empathy comes into the emotional management piece. I love it. Thank you so much, Tamara. Yeah. This was great. It, it I learned a lot. I always learn from you. I just love that. Oh, Thank you so I love, much. I love talking with you guys. Um, I love how great. you guys 
just interact. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you for introducing the three horsemen of the empathetic apocalypse uh, <laughs> to the show. My goodness. Uh, once again, a lot to think about. Um, Great. Where, where do you want people to send or to go to learn more about your work and the, the book? Are you, do you already have a landing page for the upcoming book or are we uh, looking months nope. out? Uh, it, it comes out uh, in the publishing world. Everything takes a long time. Uh, so... I have a book cover, but that's um, the landing page. A book, book cover with not a book in it yet. <laughs> yeah, but right. the script's there. Uh, oh, it's good. going through final proof editing. It's, it's a long process, yeah. but it um, comes out September of 24. Right. And so well, that's good it, timing. Wink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you at the conference. <laughs> yep. Don't think that's not on purpose. So, uh-huh. uh, um, but also, uh, you can go to TamaraRosier.com. That's my author's website. Great. All right. TamaraRosier.com. Uh, we'll link in the show notes, as always. Tamara, you're the best. Thanks for hanging out with us. We so appreciate you. Thanks. Well, I think you guys are pretty awesome. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm putting that on my website. Tamara yeah. thinks I'm pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Pretty awesome. We appreciate you downloading and listening this to this show. Thanks for your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute to the conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel in our Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level or better, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer and Tamara Rozier, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Mm-hmm.